Let's talk a little bit about uh, you know institutional demand. And this this came up on um, actually the panel that I was on previously around kind of the institutionalization of this of this marketplace. So from an institutional perspective, we'll just go down the line. We'll start here with uh, Mike with you. What are you seeing in terms of uh, institutional adoption? You know, when we started Foundry four years ago, the the idea was institutional money is coming into crypto, and institutional money is going to come into Bitcoin mining, and we. We said, let's build a business. Let's think in terms of decades. Um, not really worried about what's going to happen this month, next month. And we laid out a premise of like, at some point, nation states, energy companies are going to be mining Bitcoin, right? And we kind of wrote this down. And, and four years later, we actually have some experiments happening at nation states, small. But the energy companies are here. Like, make no mistake about it. The biggest energy companies in the world have been running experiments around Bitcoin mining over the last 12 to 18 months. We take their phone calls. We, we work with them. We help them navigate this space. They see the opportunity. I actually think from a, from a Bitcoin mining perspective, it's probably one of the greatest invention, inventions for our electrical grid in the last, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years. This idea of a controllable, an intermittent controllable load on the grid is a really powerful concept. I heard all morning about talking about ESG and we're, oh, we need more you know, renewable power. Those are intermittent power sources. You have to balance the grid with an intermittent power demand. And I don't want to turn my air conditioning off. I don't want to turn my lights off. So when you have a willing participant like a Bitcoin miner who in a flip of a switch can turn off their machines, that balances the grid. And, and those experiments are happening. A gigawatt worth of energy literally within 10 seconds shut off in Texas so they didn't have blackouts this summer. That's such a, it's a powerful concept. So when we talk about investing in Bitcoin mining, we're actually investing in our electrical grid. And I think that's a, a really powerful concept. I mean, it's more of an infrastructure play than anything else. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. How about uh, Bennett, yourself? Yeah, I mean, coming back to the institutional demand side, I think a lot of it from our perspective comes back to what I was talking about from the risk management perspective. I think a lot of companies are focused on a flight to quality. You know, after FTX, after everything they saw, there's a lot more focus on ensuring companies have good controls in place and that, you know, there's appropriate segregation of duties and clear oversight and compliance considerations going in to affect all these companies. And I also, you know, I'm starting to see a lot more experimentation with, you know, what I've always hoped for with this space, which is, you know, blockchain as a technology is just a new infrastructure layer. You know, I think, Matthew, you said it earlier, which is, you know, we're really just going to slowly start to see uh, a movement of maybe more traditional assets onto a blockchain-based architecture. You might call it crypto. We, we call these assets on top of blockchain crypto today. I prefer the term digital assets. But, you know, I, I think we're starting to see that even with the largest banks and institutions experimenting with putting all forms of different types of traditional assets on private blockchain-based architectures that they will likely eventually start to transition over to the public chain space. And so I'm very excited about the idea of bringing all different types of assets we currently work in today onto a more efficient architecture. Whether we call that crypto or digital assets, I think is not really the point. It's more about where this architecture might take us and what benefits we might derive from it. Yeah, that, that's an exciting use case for sure. Um, Matthew, what are you seeing institutional demand? Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure if banks are ever really going to be touching open source blockchains with any rigor. I mean, they really are the anti-bank kind of uh, um, thing. Uh, and Like, look at bank stocks. They're at an 80-year low right now versus the S&P, and they're not going down uh, without a fight. Like, you can see it with uh, Elizabeth Warren trying to get this uh, new measure into the National Defense Authorization Act, which is going to treat every Bitcoin miner and validator and wallet provider as if they're a financial institution and make them report on uh, information that they don't have, really, about their clients. So it's a... It, it, there's still a lot TBD in terms of institutional demand in the U.S., and I'm I'm not terribly optimistic that's going to change unless we had a major political event. But that's not necessarily true in other parts of the world, and I agree wholeheartedly about the energy story. Uh, Argentina's uh, third largest oil and gas company is now reportedly mining crypto with their excess um, methane, and there's a 
political candidate who has a chance, very pro Bitcoin political candidate who has a chance to win for the presidency uh, in two weeks. So I think the institutional adoption really will be catalyzed by changes at the government level in nation states who have a problem with with the Fed money printer. Um, but and then separate from that is like, okay, will you know Citadel and Wellington buy Bitcoin ETF when it comes out? Well, like the polling is looking good, but uh, let's wait and see. Yeah. Last but not least, Greg, what are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I agree that the public and private uh, debate is still out there. Um, I do think that we will see public architectures that have been created leveraged by private banks, but probably, at least certainly in the near term, um, in the way that Matthew is referring to in terms of they're going to control whether it's an oracle or a validator set um, to make sure that all questions are answered and information is, is tightly kept. And so I do think that um, it creates opportunity, at least out in the venture space that we look at, because even if this is a uh, an open source public architecture, there are ways for regulated entities to leverage it. Um, and uh, we are seeing, you know, not only American, but European banks and in Asia, HKEX, um, they are interacting with the technology and the way that they're doing it is by swapping out their back ends for what distributed ledger technology is. Um, it's not, you know, really a, an attempt to integrate necessarily, right? They're doing piecemeal byproduct. Um, we're just going to swap out the back end. And so I think that's a positive thing for the technology. Um, and I would say, the other interesting dynamic that's playing out is on the you know the digital asset or crypto native side we are seeing a realization of the necessity for regulation kyc aml etc and so whether it is um you know vitalik who's a co-founder of ethereum one of his latest papers is all about basically how can we responsibly merge um, regulatory with open source um, distributed ledger technology in the form of blockchain. Um, you know, and, and that's, at least in my opinion, somewhat of a significant moment for crypto. You're also seeing um, major exchanges like Uniswap uh, and others start to integrate, you know, kind of KYC, AML optionality because the crypto digital asset native have come to realize that this is a necessary function and it will not only protect you know, the common man, but it will protect them as well. There are some sacrifices that some people have to make, but um, overall it, it's, it's proved to uh, work for systems. And so um, you combine that with Bitcoin rally and you know what we focus on in terms of private markets they've they've certainly bottomed out in the last few months and these stats point to you know generally you get 29 months worth of recession we're in month number 30 and so uh, we expect for institutional investors like Franklin Templeton to continue to roll out more funds on chain, which would increase real world assets. We expect other banking participants um, and asset manager participants to do the same. Um, and at the same time, we expect more money in terms of investment to flow back in as asset prices rally um, and kind of the, the freeze of, of the crypto world thaws. Okay, and kind of more forward looking, um, what are you most excited about 2024 beyond so I think, you know, the, the other somewhat institutional demand that we see on the ground is um, for small or medium-sized businesses who are willing to um, experiment, um, there are solutions in blockchain technology. Uh, most pressing is obviously cross-border payments and, and domestic payments, whether it's Latin America or Asia, um, where we're seeing companies that leverage APIs for fintechs, um, healthcare companies, uh, uh, outsourced um, engineering talent, we're seeing them have considerable traction and product market fit because you've completely obfuscated away all of the crypto dynamics, but you're, you're leveraging crypto on the back end to make instant transfers for you know, a tenth of the price that they used to pay. Um, 
and uh, companies are, are thrilled to do this. There's, as long as the invoicing shows up correctly, um, there are no complaints whatsoever.